Hi, good morning everyone. Welcome to the ECE Colloquium. Today we are very happy to have Professor Laurent Lessard visiting us from the other UW, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, he is an assistant professor in electrical and computer engineering in, at Madison and works in the area of control theory, decentralized control, robust control, and also machine learning and optimization. And uh, he received his uh, PhD and master's and PhD from Stanford University. He did postdocs at uh, Lund University in Sweden and Berkeley, UC Berkeley. And then he joined the University of Wisconsin. Um, he has received multiple awards for his work, including the Hugo Schock Award, which is a big award uh, given by the IEEE Control Society for best paper uh, and, uh, and the NSF Career Award as well. So we look forward to hearing his talk. Thank you, Miriam. <clears throat> and, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, so my talk today is about optimization algorithms and how we can use a robust control viewpoint to try to understand something about algorithm convergence and how we might be able to analyze and design algorithms in a more systematic way. Uh, this is joint work with Benrecht and Andy Packard, who, uh, and that's Berkeley, and then my postdoc, Brian, and grad student, Akhil. So this talk is sort of going to span some control theory, some optimization, and so I, when putting this talk together, I really thought, you know, okay, well, typically people know about controls or they know about optimization, but they often don't know about both. So I'm going to try to present this work in a way that is more accessible to everybody. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit more uh, slow in the details at the beginning just to make sure that everybody's, uh, everybody can follow me. So when I'm talking about optimization algorithms, obviously there are many different algorithms we can talk about. The ones that I'm going to be focusing on for this talk are the simplest that you can think of. So they're unconstrained optimization algorithms. So you imagine that you've got a problem like this. You're trying to minimize some function f, and you're allowed to measure gradients of the function at any point. So the goal is to use a first order method, something that is fast and simple, to try to find the minimizer of this function. So I'll give you an example of some popular algorithms that people use. And for this, I'm just going to use this sort of stylized example. Imagine that these are contours of your function f, and the point there in the middle is the minimum. So these are just level curves of a function. In this case, they're a quadratic function. And you want to find that point. And all you're allowed to do is measure the slope at any one point. So one popular method is called the gradient method or gradient descent. And the idea here is that you start at some point. So you pick a random starting point, x0, for example. And you measure the gradient of the function. So that tells you the direction of steepest descent from where you currently are. And you take a step in that direction. And then wherever you end up, you repeat the process. And you keep doing this until you eventually get to the optimal point. Now what I plotted in the upper left, upper right corner is a plot of the distance to the optimal point as a function of the number of iterations that you're doing. So as you can see, it's not very fast. And the reason it's not very fast is because the contours are very squished together. And when this happens, you end up taking a very zigzaggy path because you're always moving perpendicular to the contour lines. Now you might think, well, maybe you should just take smaller steps or larger steps or do something different, but this is actually the best step size for this particular function. If you do anything differently, if you change the value of alpha, then it's going to be slower. So this is the best that you can do with a gradient method in a situation like this. But people have come up with other ways to make this a little bit faster. If all you have is gradient information, maybe there's something we can do to accelerate the convergence. So there are many ways to do this. So here's one example. It's the heavy ball method. So in the heavy ball method, you start with what looks like a gradient step, but then you add an additional step that depends on which direction your previous step was in. So you'll notice that now xk plus 1 depends on xk and xk minus 1. So you're going to need a little bit of extra memory. You have to store where your previous step was. But you're also going to need an extra parameter. You need to figure out what beta should be. And it turns out that for this heavy ball method, if you choose alpha and beta appropriately, and it turns out that the best alpha to pick here is not the same as the best alpha for the gradient method, but if you choose both of them appropriately, you will get faster convergence. And so this is what happens with the best choice of alpha and beta you get effectively larger steps, um, and it leads to a faster convergence. And then you can see that reflected on the error plot above as well. But that's not the only way to accelerate things. So here's another way. It's called Nesterov's accelerated method. So here, 
if you look at xk plus one, it also does what appears to be a gradient step. But instead of evaluating the gradient at x, you evaluate it at y, which is some weighted version of the current in the previous iterate. Again, you need two parameters, alpha and beta, and again, they're different from the ones for heavy ball, but this is what happens when you pick the best choice. It does achieve acceleration, but in a slightly different way. So rather than taking these larger steps, you end up taking these more direct steps, but they're smaller. It's not quite as fast as the heavy ball method in this example, but this is the best that you can do with Nesterov's method in this example. And these are just two possible ways of achieving acceleration. There are many others, and of course, you could add more parameters and you could make the problem even more complicated, but then the problem of figuring out what those parameters should be becomes even harder. So what people have done to try to understand these algorithms is perform what's called algorithm analysis in the optimization literature. And it's got three steps. The first thing you're gonna do is write down the definition of the algorithm. So in this case, we had three different methods. We had the gradient method, the heavy ball method, and Nesterov's accelerated method, but whatever other methods you've got, you can write those down as well. Then you have to think about the function class you're gonna care about. Now, if you're analyzing an algorithm, you have to say something about the function it's going to be applied to. There's no such thing as an algorithm that works well all the time for every function. The more you know about the function, the more refined your algorithm can be. It may even affect how you choose these alpha and beta parameters, right? So in the example that I showed you in the previous slide, the class of functions were quadratic functions. So functions that look something like this. And they were optimized so that they work over a class of quadratic functions. And the way we define the class of quadratic functions is we say that Q, which is the matrix that defines that quadratic form, has eigenvalues that are bounded above and below by little m and big L. So that, sort of put, that, that puts a limit on how squished those contours can be. So L divided by M is called a condition number. That thing tells you how squished the contours can be. And then we also need some sort of performance criterion. Well, what we were using on the previous slide was the distance to optimality. But you could also use something else like the, the magnitude of the function value itself or the magnitude of the gradient, because you expect the gradient to be zero when you get to optimality. So there's a lot of different performance criteria that you can use here. Okay, so what happens when you do algorithm analysis? You get a result that looks something like this. Now this, I'll draw your attention to the equation in the middle here. This is the sort of thing we're trying to prove. We wanna say that after k steps, the distance to the optimal point x star is bounded above by some function of it's rho to the power of k. And we think of rho as the convergence rate. Now if rho is smaller, then that thing is gonna to go to zero more quickly and you're gonna get faster convergence. And as rho gets closer to one, then it becomes sort of a, a, a vacuous statement. It just tells you, just doesn't tell you that you're actually converging. And I'm gonna be plotting the results like this. So just start with the one on the, the left here. On the x-axis, I had the condition ratio, L over M. That tells you how squished the contours can be. Now we expect that as they get more squished, convergence is gonna be slower because you're gonna have more oscillation. So that means that rho is going to get closer to one. And that's sort of what we see. On the y-axis, I've got convergence rate. And for all three methods, it gets closer to one as the condition ratio gets larger. But the heavy ball method is always the faster one, so it's got the lower curve. And then the gradient method is the slower one and it's got the upper curve, okay? Now the plot on the right is actually showing the same information as the plot on the left, but it's plotted in a slightly different way. So rather than talking about convergence rate, you might be interested in a number of iterations to convergence. So I might say, I wanna to converge to within a tolerance of 10 to the minus three, or 10 to the minus five. So you pick some epsilon and you say, how many iterations am I going to have to do such that I'm guaranteed that I will be within epsilon of the true solution? And that's a totally reasonable thing to, to think about. And it turns out that the number of iterations to convergence is going to be proportional to minus one over log of rho. So what I'm plotting on the right here is that quantity, minus one over log rho, as a function of the condition ratio. So you can think of the y-axis as a surrogate for number of iterations to convergence, and it's plotted on a log-log scale. So you can see here, again, as we saw before, the gradient method is the slowest, and then the other two methods are faster, but this plot reveals information that we couldn't really see in the first plot which is that if you look at Nesterov and heavy ball, they're both kind of fast. Even though the heavy ball is faster, they're within a constant factor of the number of iterations, right? So meanwhile, the gradient method gets slower at a much faster rate. Okay, 
Uh, it's also been shown, actually, on this plot, the slopes are a slope of a half for the two accelerated methods and the slope of one for the gradient method. So these are, are sort of the baselines that we have. It turns out that if you're only using a first order method with gradient information like this, it's been shown that you can't do better than a slope of a half over uh, strongly convex functions, which is a class of functions I'll talk about in a moment. So basically, this is sort of what we can expect out of these kinds of methods. Okay, so the point of my talk, or what I'm trying to convey here uh, to you today, is that many algorithms, is the ones that I showed you, but, but others as well, can be viewed as dynamical systems with feedback. And this idea of performing algorithm analysis, this process that I just described, is equivalent to solving a robust control problem. And I'll try to make that more clear in the slides that come. Second of all, you can solve a small convex program that you can use to recover these rates and these plots that I showed you in an automatic way so that you don't have to do ad hoc case-by-case -case analysis for each of these separate algorithms to figure out this analysis. You can do it in an automated way and analyze all algorithms in one shot. And finally, if I have time at the end, I'm gonna show you a little bit of um, some work that we've done with this as it applies to something called distributed optimization, where there's been a lot of recent interest in a large class of algorithms that perform that solve this problem, but there, up until now, hasn't been a very unified way to analyze all of them and to understand how to compare them. Okay, so I said that we can think of, I said on the previous slide, we can think of algorithm analysis as robust control, and then we can view algorithms as dynamical systems. So how do we do that? I'm gonna do this with an example. So we're gonna start with the heavy ball method, which is, uh, these are, this is the equation in blue at the top. Remember, it's like a gradient step, but then you add this extra piece that depends on what your previous step looked like. And the idea is that we're gonna to try to separate the parts of these dynamics. And the reason I say dynamics is because we were just solving an optimization problem. There's nothing dynamic about it. There's some function and you wanna find its minimum. But when you use an algorithm like this, now you've got this xk that's moving around at each iteration. And it's getting closer and closer to the optimal point. So you can think of that as a dynamical system. This dynamical system has two parts. There's the parts that have to do with the algorithm. That's the part that we get to choose. And then there's the part that has to do with the function that we're optimizing, which is something that we don't get to choose, um, but we may know something about the function. So we can actually separate this, these dynamics into two pieces, and it's gonna look something like this. So here I'm defining pk to be the previous state, xk minus one, and I'm defining u, the input to my dynamical system, as the gradient of f. So here I've got this block diagram that basically says that as u goes in, u is my gradient, I run these dynamics forward in time to figure out the next x and the next p, and then I get the output y, which in this case is just x, and then that is where I evaluate the gradient, and then I just keep going around in circles. Now when I write things in a block diagram like this, if you're a controls person, this, this, seems, this will seem familiar to you, but block diagrams are just a different way of representing algebraic equations, right? I haven't changed anything here. By writing this as a block diagram, I'm just writing down that blue equation at the top in a slightly different way. But this is a very instructive way to write it because it separates the problem into these two pieces. Now the piece at the top is the algorithm. It's got alpha and beta in it. This is the part that we get to pick, but it's also a linear dynamical system and it's decoupled. And I'll say more about that in a moment. The second part is the function. That's the part that may be nonlinear. We don't necessarily know what it is when we start. And it's where all of the complexity and uncertainty in our algorithm's performance lies. Why do I say it's decoupled? Well, when we're solving optimization, when we're solving optimization problems, um, the function may live in a very high dimensional space. We may be doing gradient descent in a million dimensions. And so this x vector might be of size a million. But when we use this algorithm, you'll notice that x, the vector x, is only being multiplied by some scalar times the identity. And so is p. So what this means is that the first component of y only depends on the first component of x, whose update only depends on the first component of x and p and the first component of u. So you can actually write this as, um, as a stacked uh, version of a whole bunch of really sim of simpler systems if you think about these dynamics one component at a time. So even though it was a million dimensional dynamical system, now it's actually just a million copies of a two-dimensional system. And that's actually gonna be important later because it turns out that 
the method we're using to analyze these algorithms does not depend on that one million. It only depends on the two here. So the fact that it splits up into smaller pieces that are all the same actually really helps us. Okay. So the point is, if you've got your optimization algorithm, you can write it as some linear system G here, and whose equations are in the top right there, and they're defined by some matrix A, B, and C, in feedback with this gradient. And depending on whether you're analyzing the gradient method, the heavy ball method, the Nesterov's method, or some other method, those just correspond to different choices of A, B, and C. So if you want to analyze a different algorithm, then we just swap out the corresponding A, B, and C for that algorithm in, in our analysis. So that tells us how to deal with G, but how do we deal with F? Well, I said at the beginning, we, well, we don't necessarily know what F is, but we have to know something about it. Otherwise, there's no way we're gonna be able to say anything useful about the algorithm. So when we analyze algorithms and we think about what sorts of things we can say about F, there's a lot of assumptions that people typically make in the literature about functions. A really common one is that the function is convex. And if the function is convex, well, what do you know about it? Well, there's a bunch of inequalities that you can write down that, that are true for that function. This is, these are two inequalities that you can write down, and they both hold for all choices of x and y. And these are definitions. I mean, if, if your function is convex, this will be true. If this is true, your function is convex. But that's a really broad class of functions. You may know something else about your function. For example, you may know that it has Lipschitz gradients. And then there's another set of inequalities that you can write. Here's three of them. And these are all things that are true about the function. So these, this is information that we should be using in our, in our analysis somehow. Even more information, perhaps you know that the function is strongly convex with Lipschitz gradients. Here's an example of something that you can write down for such functions. But maybe your function isn't convex at all. Uh, then there may be a lot of other things you can say about the function. So here I just collected a list of various properties of functions that people have used in the literature to prove convergence properties of algorithms. So the PL condition is a very famous one. These are all conditions that are necessary for convexity or strong convexity, but not sufficient. So all strongly convex functions satisfy this, but not the other way around. And this is nice because we don't have to assume something as strong as convexity to be able to analyze uh, an algorithm. Maybe we want to make weaker assumptions, and these are examples of weaker assumptions that we could be making. Now, of course, if I asked you, you know, what, what, what did all these inequalities have in common? The key thing here is that they were all quadratic functions of y and u, which are the inputs and outputs of my gradient. So actually, if, you, if we look back here, you'll notice that all of these inequalities, whenever gradient, the gradient is multiplied by something, it's multiplied by x or by itself. Uh, x can be squared. Function values always appear alone. And this is true of all of these inequalities as well. And it turns out that as long as that property is true, then this analysis that I'm going to describe to you will work. So we can swap out the different algorithms by changing A, B, and C. We can also swap out the different assumptions about the function by swapping out different assumptions here. So the main idea, the main strategy for this analysis works like this. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look for a Lyapunov function V. So what a Lyapunov function is, is a certificate that will show that the function is getting closer, or the, the algorithm's dynamics are getting closer and closer to the optimal point as we move along. We're gonna look for a function, a Lyapunov function that is quadratic in the iterates, x, and linear in the function values, f. And for the function class of interest for which we're doing the analysis, where can, we can write down all the valid inequalities, and I showed you a bunch of them on the previous slides, but all of them, remember, are quadratic in x and the gradient, and, or x and u in this case, and they're linear in f. So each of them is gonna have some form that looks like m greater than or equal to zero, and I might have a whole bunch of these inequalities. And the goal is to prove something like this. We wanna prove that v at k plus one is going to be less than or equal to rho squared times v at times k. So that means that this function v, which you can think of as uh, an energy for your system, decreases by a factor of rho, uh, rho squared at each time step. And then the smaller the rho that I can find that makes this true, well that will tell me something about the rate at which my state, or my, my iterates are converging to x star. That's the rough idea of how this is going to work. And the way you prove it, 
is by certifying something of this form. So if you look at that in inequality in the middle of the box, we want to prove something like this. We want to show that vk plus 1 minus rho squared vk plus the sum of all of the m's, remember each of those things had to be greater than or equal to 0, weighted by some positive lambda i coefficients has to be less than or equal to 0. And you might be asking, well, where did this come from? How did I come up with this? Well, just hold that thought for a second and suppose that I could prove this. Suppose that I could find some set of lambdas such that this was always true. Well then, because I know that each of my m's is positive, then I've got this vk plus 1 minus rho squared vk plus a sum of positive things is negative. That tells you that that first piece, the vk plus 1 minus rho squared vk, had to be negative, which is exactly what we were trying to prove. So the goal is to try to show something like what's in the blue box. And because this v was, as I said before, quadratic in the x's and linear in the f's, and the m's are also quadratic in the x's and u's, then what I'm trying to show is that some quadratic inequality holds for all possible x's and u's. And this turns into a semi-definite program because each of these things are quadratics. So I could write down a quadratic form with x's and u's on both sides and some matrix in the middle. And that matrix, if, it's, if that inequality is going to be true for all values of x and u, that matrix has to be negative semi-definite. And therefore, I can write down the semi-definite program. Typically, the SDP or semi-definite program that I can write down is going to be very small. 4 by 4, 5 by 5, something of that range, which means that you can solve it really, really quickly on a laptop in a matter of milliseconds. OK. Um, if you have a background in robust control or if you've taken courses on robust control, some of these equations that I wrote down may seem familiar to you. So I just want to quickly point out some of the connections between what I've said and robust control. So this algorithm analysis, this block diagram that connects a linear system and a nonlinearity is called the Luray problem. It's been around for a very long time, since the 40s at least. The semi-definite program I wrote is an application of what's called the Lossy S procedure, if you're familiar with that. Um, Lyapunov functions of this form, quadratic in x and then linear in f, are called Popov-type Lyapunov functions. Um, you can also frame everything that I've just said in terms of what are called IQCs, or integral quadratic constraints, but I'm not going to go into detail on what those are. And if you make the assumption that your function is strongly convex with Lipschitz gradients, then these inequalities that we're using actually have a name in controls, and they're called zames fowle multipliers, which actually date back to the 60s. So a lot of the robust control stuff that this is connected to is pretty old, and it's been around for a long time, even though a lot of these applications to optimization are much more recent. So just to give you an example of what this semi-definite program looks like, here's what happens when you apply it to, apply what I said to gradient descent with strongly convex functions and Lipschitz gradients. You end up with that simple equation in the middle of the page that connects all of the different variables relevant to the problem. M is the strong convexity parameter. L is the Lipschitz constant. Lambda is that parameter that we're looking for. We're trying to find a positive lambda such that this is true. Alpha is the step size in our gradient descent, and rho is the convergence rate. So if I am applying gradient descent, descent with a step size of alpha and on strongly convex functions with parameter m with Lipschitz parameter l, and I'm asking the question, can I converge at a rate of rho equals 0.5 or can I not? Or will I or will I not? Well, I can substitute all those values I just told you into this, and if there is a lambda that makes this true, then the answer is yes. So what's cool about this is that this gives you a complete characterization of when the gradient method converges. With something like this, I can answer questions such as, OK, well, for a fixed step size, what is the best convergence rate that I can certify? Well, in that case, I would be minimizing rho and making this feasible. That's a convex problem. Or I could ask the question, if I want to achieve a particular convergence rate, what is the range of step sizes that will allow me to do that? That's also a convex problem here. Now alpha is the variable. So there's a lot that you can say with this sort of characterization, and it tells you everything that you need to know about convergence. Now it turns out that this is a particularly special one because you can solve it analytically. With a little bit of simplification, taking some sure complements and doing some other stuff, you end up by, re you can reduce that equation in the middle to this one here. Rho is upper bounded by the maximum of those two quantities. 
And if you actually solve that to find what the best possible alpha is, you end up with this, that the optimal alpha, the one that gives you the minimum possible row, is 2 over m plus l, and then the optimal row is l minus m over l plus m. And these are classical results that you can obtain by doing a lot of manipulating inequalities and doing a lot of work by hand to eventually come to this result. But this was obtained sort of automatically just from this formulation. The cool thing is that when you replace the gradient method with other algorithms or you replace the function assumptions with other assumptions, that just leads to more complicated semi-definite programs that often you can't solve by hand but do give you really good results. So this avoids the need to do this case-by-case -case analysis. Okay, so I just want to show you what happens when you apply these results and see what sorts of things you can derive. So in some cases, we can recover existing results, and in other cases, we can improve on existing results. So I'm going to show you a few examples here. And I'll be mainly illustrating um, the algorithms that I've already shown you already, so the gradient method, heavy ball, and Nastrov's method. But first, we need to talk about what classes of functions we're going to consider. Right? So I said that there's all these different assumptions about functions that you can make. I'm going to restrict my, my talk here to just three function classes. And I'm just sort of representing them with pictures here to talk about what my assumptions are on the gradient of f. So the first case is when the gradient is linear. I'm going to give an upper and a lower bound. And this is, the, this is a 1D representation of what the gradient as a function of x would look like. So that blue region tells you this is, these are the allowable gradients. And that's the information that I know about my function. But other than that, I don't know anything. I know that it's linear, and it's in that range. At the other end, I have what are called sector-bounded functions. And here, that's an upper and lower bound, but the function can do anything in the middle. Now, functions like that still have a gradient of 0 at exactly one place, which is in the middle, right, at, at 0. And so those are still functions where you can talk about optimizing them. That makes sense. But the function itself will not necessarily be convex. In the middle, I have sector-bounded and slope-restricted. So I still have these upper and lower bounds. But the second derivative, so the slope of the red curve, is bounded below by the lower blue slope and bounded above by the upper blue slope. So there's some sort of restriction on how quickly the red line can move around. This is what the gradient looks like. What would the function look like? In the case where my gradient is linear, my function will be quadratic. And these blue bounds provide upper and lower quadratic bounds. So this is the quadratic case. It's the same as the example I showed at the beginning. If your function has sector-bounded and slope-restricted gradients, it turns out that uh, you can have strongly convex functions with Lipschitz gradients. And if you have a strongly convex function with Lipschitz gradients, then it will have this property of having a, a gradient that is sector-bounded and slope-restricted. So these are functions that are strongly convex, and, uh, but there's a limit on how quickly they can curve. And again, you have the same upper and lower blue limits. The sector-bounded case is a little bit more complicated. I invented the name radially quasi-convex, but it's, it's also similar to star convexity. But there isn't, I haven't seen in the literature this exact definition anywhere for this class of functions. Basically, the gradient is 0 at exactly one place, which is at the origin there. But the function doesn't necessarily have to be convex. So this is a more complicated and broader class of functions. So I'm going to analyze the three algorithms that I showed you at the beginning of this talk for these three classes of functions. And we can do this automatically using the framework that I described. So what happens with the gradient method? Well, the gradient method, you've seen this figure before. It's the exact same as the one before. Actually, the gradient method gives you the exact same result, regardless of whether you assume your functions are quadratic, strongly convex, or radially quasi-convex. Another way of saying this is that the worst case performance, or the worst case that can happen with a gradient algorithm, is when you apply it to a quadratic function. That's actually the worst case. Making it radially quasi-convex and having all this weirdness doesn't actually make things any worse for the gradient method. And we can solve this analytically. And I showed you the, the solution on the previous slide. So you get this red curve. And then there's a, this is a Nestorov and Heavyball just for comparison. So not particularly interesting here, though it is kind of neat that you can get all three results using the same approach. Nestorov's method. So here Nestorov's method, we see three different convergence rates for the three different classes of functions, which makes sense. If I have a bigger class of functions, I should expect a slower worst case convergence rate. And the fastest possible convergence rate for, should be for the most restricted class of functions, the quadratics. So if you look on the left here, the black curve is Nestorov's for quadratics. The 
the orange curve that you see here is Nesterov's method for strongly convex functions. So that's the middle class of functions I described. And then this green curve is the radially quasi-convex set of functions. And you'll see that this green curve actually crosses the one point, which means that beyond a condition number of about 10, you can no longer guarantee that Nesterov's method will always um, converge. So the order makes sense that the green should be the worst, then orange, then black. The purple dotted line here is an interesting one. The purple dotted line is actually the rate that is, was derived from Nesterov's textbook where he explained his method. So when he came up with Nesterov's method, what we all call Nesterov's method, some people call it the fast gradient method also, he came up with an analysis which involves um, a pretty, it's actually it's pretty involved, his, his analysis. It involves coming up with a sequence of recursively generated quadratic upper and lower bounds that eventually give you a convergence rate for the method when you take the limit. And it looks so complicated that you think to yourself, well, I don't really know where this came from or how, how he came up with this, but uh, it gives you a result. And when you go over here on, on the plot on the right, you'll see that it also has that same slope of a half. So in, this, in that sense, it gets the fastest rate possible if all you care about is the slope. But in terms of the actual value of, this, of the rate, the actual value of rho, um, you can get a tighter bound, strictly tighter bound, when you use this SDP analysis than if you use um, his, his more complicated approach. Okay, so in other words, the orange curve and the purple dotted curve are in fact making the exact same assumptions. It's just that the orange curve is a better upper bound on the worst case performance rate. So this is nice. This means that this approach can actually improve on existing bounds, not just reproduce existing bounds. For the heavy ball method, we find that both the quasi-convex and the strongly convex cases cannot certify stability. Now, this is only a sufficient condition, right? These curves are upper bounds on the true worst case performance. It's possible that the reason these things are going unstable is just because our analysis isn't very good. That the, the true curve is even lower than those, right? How do we know that this orange curve we came up with is the right one? That there isn't a, a better one that's even smaller than the orange curve? But we know it has to be larger than the black curve, but we don't know is there something in between the two, right? So what we did was we set out to try to show that these bounds were tight. So we tried to look for counterexamples. We tried to look for examples of functions that actually are unstable. Now, if you're gonna look for a function that's unstable when you apply the heavy ball method to it, well, this tells you where to start looking. Your condition number should be at least beyond here, right? It should be beyond 20 at least if you wanna get, uh, because we know this, this actually certifies that it is stable for anything over here. So your condition number needs to be high enough so that you're in this region here. So here's an example that we found, a counterexample. And this is, this is the function, this blue curve here. It is a piecewise quadratic function, it's strongly convex. And it looks quadratic, but if you squint your eyes a little bit, you'll realize that in between the two red dotted lines, the function's flatter than it is everywhere else. So it's almost quadratic, but not quite. Um, it has high curvature, to the left of the red dotted line and to the right of it, 25 over 2x squared, but it has a much slow, uh, smaller curvature in between the two red dotted lines. And we saw that the heavy ball method for quadratic functions is really fast, and that was what I showed you on the first slide. That was the fastest one. But if your function deviates from being quadratic even a little bit, and in this case, just like this, if you start your heavy ball method anywhere between 3.07 and 3.46, that it will converge to this attractive limit cycle where it will just bounce between these three points. And it will never converge to the optimizer, which is at zero. So this is just an example. I mean, it was not that easy to find this example, but L over M is 25 for this example, which if you look on the previous slide, puts us at about here. So it's pretty close to where this is. And actually recently, um, other people have been able to refine this and find counterexamples that are arbitrary, arbitrarily close to the orange line. So we're pretty confident that these bounds are tight. Um, and this is an example of what happens when, um, when they fail. Okay, uh, for the remainder of the talk, I would like to show you what happens when we apply the same technique to a much more complicated class of algorithms. Namely, algorithms used for distributed optimization. So let me say a few things about what distributed optimization is. 
So here the problem setting is that I'm trying to solve an optimization problem again, but it is a sum of functions that I'm trying to minimize. So f1 of x plus f2 of x plus f3 of x. And the catch is that nobody knows all of the f's. You've got a network of agents here represented by this graph, and each agent knows one of the components of that sum. And each agent can only evaluate the gradient of their local function, the one that they know. So agent number five here has their own internal state, x5, and they can evaluate the gradient of f5. And you want an algorithm that does this, the following thing. At each step, each agent here, represented by a node, can evaluate its local gradient, gradient of fi. It can share what it knows with its neighbors, but just the neighbors that are on the graph here connected by arrows. So you can only share in the directions of the arrows. They can receive information from their neighbors. They can perform local computation, so they can have some local memory where they update that based on what they've seen. And then they just keep running this algorithm, only ever using local gradient information and only sharing with their neighbor, immediate neighbors. And the goal is that eventually, two things will happen. One, all agents' internal states x will converge to the same value, x. They will all converge to the same x. That's, so they have to achieve consensus. The second thing that's going to happen is that that x that they converge to will be the solution to the optimization problem at the top. It will be the optimizer of the sum of functions. Now, when might this happen in, in, in real life? Um, there are a lot of distributed machine learning problems that you can write this way. So for example, let's say that you had a bunch of drones that were surveying an area, and each one was gathering, let's say, climate data or some other information about the local region that they had. You were trying to fit some, solve some large regression problem involving the data of all of the drones. And no single drone has enough memory or computational capacity to solve the entire problem, and also they don't have the data from the other drones. But when you write down the objective function, it's going to be a sum of terms where each term depends on the different local data pieces. So each agent, each drone, can compute local gradient, but they can't compute because they don't have the rest of the data. They can't compute those other gradients. And because of communication restrictions, maybe they can only communicate with agents that are nearby and so on. So I mean, obviously, this is a pretty stylized example, but it's been studied enough that I thought it was worth taking a look at to see what sorts of algorithms people had developed, even for this simple stylized scenario. Uh, one more piece of uh, terminology. I'm going to be using these things called gossip matrices. So here's an example of a gossip matrix. It has a sparsity pattern that corresponds to the adjacency matrix of the graph. Right? So you have zeros whenever two agents can't communicate in a particular direction. And they're doubly stochastic, so the rows and columns sum to one. Why are these matrices important? If I use an algorithm of this form, xi k plus 1 equals the sum over all these wij's, what that's saying is that each agent is taking a weighted sum of the information from its neighbors. And if each agent repeatedly does this, and you're using a gossip matrix to do it, then eventually everybody will converge to the average value of all of the local x's. So uh, this is a way of achieving consensus, and the process is kind of like diffusion. At every step, you're doing some sort of averaging of your neighbors, and you're doing the averaging in such a way that the total sum is always preserved, and eventually you converge to the average. So this is a gossip matrix, and we're going to be using these a lot. OK, now what is the simplest algorithm you might think of to do to solve this problem? Here's one possible example. We know gradient descent, right? We know average consensus. If we do this repeated gossiping, we're eventually going to converge to the average. So why not combine the two? Why not have an algorithm that has each agent perform a gossip step and then perform a gradient update? It seems reasonable at first glance, but it turns out that a method like this doesn't actually work. This is called distributed gradient descent, and it was proposed in 2009, and since then many other methods have been proposed. But just to give you an insight as to why this doesn't work, if you think about gradient descent, ordinary gradient descent, the case that we were talking about before, we know that at the optimizer, the gradient is zero. So, once, so if I initialize my algorithm and I'm lucky and I start at the optimal point, I'm not going to move. I'm going to stay there. That doesn't happen here because at the optimal point, the sum of the gradients of the fi's is zero. But each individual gradient of fi is not zero. So even if I started at the optimizer, then everybody, every agent would instantly move away from the optimizer because they would move in the direction of their local gradient. 
So a method like this doesn't work. In fact, the only way to get it to work is to have alpha diminish over time. So I have a diminishing step size. And even in the case where all of your functions are strongly convex, a method like this converges sublinearly. So it doesn't even get this linear rate of convergence that we were seeing before. So average consensus converges geometrically or exponentially or however you want to call that. The optimizers say uh, linear convergence, controls people say exponential convergence. Um, average consensus converges linearly. So does gradient descent for strongly convex functions. But when you combine them like this, it's worse than either one. So that's not satisfactory. People have been doing a lot of work in this area to try to find algorithms that perform better, and a lot of people have succeeded. So here are several algorithms that people have come up with. Distributed gradient descent, DGD, is the first one that I showed you. And this is a sort of a vectorized way of writing down the equations, where they depend on W, a gossip matrix, and the local gradients, F. Here, they've just been vectorized. So XK is the stacked XIs of each of the agents. And this looks really complicated. Obviously, there's a lot of different algorithms that people have come up with. All of these other ones that I mentioned here all achieve an exponential rate of convergence when you apply them to strongly convex functions. So success, right? I mean, we can actually combine these two things. Even though it's not particularly intuitive how these things work, people have written a lot of papers on trying to explain intuitively why you know, things look a certain way. Anyway, but uh, I'm going to speed up a little bit here. The point is that this framework that I described at the beginning of the talk, you can use it here too, except instead of having feedback with just gradient f, you have feedback with w as well. And instead of worrying about the class of functions, I'm going to worry about the class of functions and the class of graphs. Because you expect that a graph, a graph that is more sparsely connected will be slower, will not perform as well as a graph that is fully connected. And that turns out to be the case. So we need some way of measuring that and bounding that connectedness of the graph, and we can get results that depend on the connectedness of the graph. Um, this is the way that we represent the algorithms, again, as a linear dynamical system. And it turns out that all the algorithms on the previous page, we can write them this way. So, you, so now we have more matrices because we have two inputs and two outputs to our algorithm. And so we're going to need A, B, C, D. We're going to need nine of these matrices to describe the algorithm. And these are the nine matrices for all of the algorithms I showed you on the, the previous slide. So a lot of different options. Some of them have three internal states of memory. Some of them have two internal states. Some of them communicate one variable with all of their neighbors at each step, first row. Some of them communicate two variables at each step. So even though those algorithms all look kind of complicated, when you actually implement them, some are more complicated than others in terms of memory requirements or communication requirements. OK. Uh, to perform the analysis, I have to make assumptions about the functions, and I have to make assumptions about the graphs. So do, the assumptions about the functions are that they have these quadratic upper and lower bounds. This is similar to the quasi-convex assumption that I made before. And the condition number kappa determines how far apart the two, the upper bound and lower bound are as a ratio. So when kappa is equal to 1, it's just a quadratic function. When kappa is equal to 8, there's even more variability in the functions and so on. For the graphs, I'm going to be using a measure called the spectral gap. And it is, uh, it's, the, it's characterized by that inequality there, which also happens to be a quadratic inequality. That's no, uh, no coincidence. Um, the idea here is that the sigma measures a notion of connectedness. When the graph is fully connected, every agent connected to every other agent, then sigma is 0. If your graph is ever disconnected, two islands, for example, then sigma will be 1. If sigma is strictly less than 1, then it's going to be connected. But the larger sigma is, the more time it takes for you to communicate everything to everybody else. So this one on the right, you can see, yes, it's connected. But you have to send things all the way around the graph before they come back to you. Whereas this, everything only takes one step. So this is just a simple example with the corresponding sigmas. And the idea is that we're going to place an upper bound on what sigma can be. Here, I wanted to just put down what the linear matrix inequality is. This looks very complicated. You've got two inequalities here. The variables are p, q, and r. But the parameters are m and l and sigma. So as complicated as this looks, if I want to swap out the algorithm, all I do is I change a, b, c, and d to whatever the new algorithm is. If I want to change the assumptions on the function, I just change m and l. And that gets reflected in m0. That changes. If I want to change the class of graphs, I just change sigma. And that gets reflected in m1. So this is, again, a linear matrix inequality that handles all of the cases. And you can analyze all of the functions, or all the algorithms that I showed you before, just by making appropriate substitutions into this result. So there's a lot of flexibility here. This is the result that you get. 
So here on the x-axis, I have spectral gap. As that gets closer to one, you expect slower convergence. On the y-axis, I have linear rate. And then here I'm plotting all these different methods. And you can see that, well, it's not, it's not that straightforward to talk about which algorithm is better. Actually, as you increase spectral gap, at first the green method is the best, then the purple is the best, and then the red one is the best. So there's no ultimate winner here. Now, all of these methods had a parameter that I had to tune, step size. So we wanted to be fair to all of the algorithms. So what we did is we did a grid search over all possible step sizes for each possible sigma. So this is actually, this, is, this isn't even realistic because this is assuming that we could somehow find the optimal step size and we knew it ahead of time. So we tried all the possible step sizes as a function of sigma. So this is presenting each algorithm in its best possible light. The lower bounds that I'm showing here, the lower bound at the bottom is what you get for just using gradient descent. The lower bound at the top is what you get if you're just doing pure consensus. So you can't expect to ever beat those lower bounds, but there's still a big gap in the middle there where you have to wonder, can we actually close that gap? Can we actually find an algorithm that is as fast as pure consensus and as fast as gradient descent when the graph is not very well connected? So just to tell you a few things about algorithm design, we actually did try to optimize these equations. We had to make a lot of simplifying assumptions. Eventually we came up with this really simple form where we only communicate one variable and we have a minimum amount of storage and we tried to optimize within that small domain. Um, so I'm not claiming that this is the best possible algorithm, but it turns out that making all these simplifying assumptions was still enough to get an algorithm that was better than all the other ones. And so once you do that, you get this method in blue here. And so we can't close the gap completely, but we can definitely outperform all the alg other algorithms that have been performed, or all the other algorithms that have been proposed so far. And this is largely thanks to the fact that we have this unified analysis, right? If we didn't have this unified analysis, all these separate papers that are presenting all these separate algorithms, each propose separate analyses and also have separate tuning recommendations for alpha, and it's a big mess. This is a unified method that allows us to actually go from analysis to design. One thing I want to show quickly here is uh, this question about upper bounds, right? Again, we're just finding upper bounds on performance. We don't know. Maybe our method actually does follow the blue dotted line, and it's just that our analysis is not powerful enough to detect that difference. So what we did was we wanted to see, well, or it's also possible that the green method is in fact as good as ours, and our method is not revealing that, right? So how do we know this? We did the same thing as before. We tried to find worst case examples. In this case, a worst case example is much harder to find because it involves not only finding functions that perform badly, but you have to find the function that performs badly if you choose that function simultaneously for each of the agents. So you have to make a lot of function choices and you have to choose the graph for a particular sigma. You have to make a lot of decisions here to find a worst case example. And you may need to search, you may need your graph to be very large before you start to find worst case examples. So here are some worst case examples that we were able to find. This is for the green method here, and we tried it at three different values of sigma, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and 0 0.9, which would correspond to uh, cases where it is fast, almost unstable, and then unstable. So those are the three dotted lines. And then these green traces are examples. We had to go up to 15 agents, and they're still one dimensional functions, and this is for a cap of 10. So this is a proof by picture, I guess, that um, we think that our bounds are tight because these green lines match the dotted ones, but we don't have a mathematical proof that these are tight results. Um, actually finding these green curves and finding this graph and so on was a really complicated process. It basically involved solving a non-convex quadratic program at each time step. We use a sort of greedy approach where at each time step you ask yourself, at the next time step, what is the worst possible function gradients and worst possible graph that I could have so that my Lyapunov function it gets maximized at each time step? And so that's a complicated optimization problem. And it actually turns out that using a non -con or just a local interior point solver was really effective at solving this. And eventually we got, we got this. So, um, oh yeah. Uh, I can quickly say we also have an interpretation for this algorithm that we found. If you use ADMM, if you're familiar with ADMM, uh, to write down this, this, uh, this algorithm, uh, 
or actually, just, if you just use ADMM directly on this distributed optimization problem, you get something like this, where the first step involves finding an argument of a function, the second step involves uh, global averaging. And the problem with this is that you can't actually implement this in our, in our setting because you cannot do global averaging. That would require everybody to send everything to one agent, average, and then send the information back. And we can't do that because we are only allowed these single step communications. It turns out that if you approximate that first step, that argmin, by just doing one step of gradient descent, and then you approximate that global averaging by doing one step of average consensus, you get inexact ADMM, which looks like this. And it turns out that by carefully choosing the parameters of this inexact ADMM, ADMM, you recover exactly the algorithm that we have designed to solve this problem. So there is at least one interpretation of what our, our optimized algorithm is doing, and it's an inexact ADMM. So, um, okay, so, so, so far what I've told you in this talk, and I'm just gonna wrap up quickly here, uh, what I described is this unified analysis framework for the first half of the talk, and there's a PSYOPs paper from 2016 that describes this. The distributed optimization work is much more recent. Um, it's going to appear, it's on archive already, but if you want the link, I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, it's gonna, apply, uh, gonna show up in transactions on uh, this, this year. But you know, this is only a small slice of what we were able to do with this. We've also looked at operator splitting methods, weakly convex functions, stochastic optimization, uh, cases with adversarial noise, a lot of other scenarios that we were able to analyze with this very general setting and this very general perspective of viewing algorithms as robust control. Okay, uh, so that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, if you have, there's more information on my website and uh, I'm also happy to answer email or questions uh, right now. So thank you. Okay, are there any questions? Questions? Okay. Yeah, I have one question. Mm -hmm. How about non-smooth functions? Is there a way to model those and put it in this frame? Uh, non-smooth functions, yes. Um, so for example, the, the quasi-convex case that I showed, actually, there's no assumption of smoothness there. Oh, I see. I mean, even though, even though I showed <laughs> smooth. That's right, the gradient was allowed to, like there was a piecewise linear gradient one. <clears throat> okay, I see. Right, and in fact, uh, it doesn't even have to be continuous. Mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. it, in fact, it doesn't even have to be static, mm -hmm. right? That, that assumption is not saying anything about the function being the same at each time step. It could be a different function that satisfies those constraints at each time step. And in fact, even in the analysis with jumps. the, Let's see. yeah, so even in the analysis that I showed for the distributed optimization, there's no assumption that the graph is fixed. So at each, oh, so these, these are, strong robustness guarantees that as long as that spectral gap bound is maintained at each time step, it could be a completely different graph at each time step. It, even the graph could be chosen adversarially to change. Mm. And yeah, uh, these, these are bounds that hold in that case. If we assume that the graph was fixed, then that would be a m more complicated problem to solve, paradoxically, but um, because now the graph is more constrained, so we need more constraints to describe it, which makes the optimization more difficult. Uh -huh. If we solve that version of the problem, then our bounds would improve, right? And then the algorithm that we came up with probably wouldn't be optimal anymore. So the optimal algorithm we came up with was optimized under those assumptions that we're, that it strong. has to be robust to adversarial variations in the graph. Uh -huh. Yeah. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Any questions? Anyone else? Yeah. yeah. In the distributed optimization case, you mentioned that uh, you needed to do a grid search over alpha. Yes. Whereas in the previous case, you could fix rho and minimize alpha for as a complex program. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't this possible? Oh, good question. So. Please, what to repeat the question? Yeah, sure. So the question was, um, when I showed the example of gradient descent at the beginning of the talk, we could actually use alpha as an optimization variable and find the best alpha in one shot, but for the distributed optimization case, I had to do a grid search. Um, it turns out that actually gradient descent is the only example where alpha shows up in a convex way. If I wanted to optimize step size for Nestrov's method or heavy ball, you also have to do a grid search there. Um, and the reason is that it just so happens that with, um, maybe I can show the slide actually. Uh, Okay, so yeah, so 
so the reason alpha shows up in a linear way is because this is what, lo what it looks like after you've used a sure complement identity. Ordinarily, alpha would show up as alpha squared somewhere and alpha somewhere else, and it would be nonlinear in alpha. It just so happened to work out in this case that it was that you could make it linear. Um, but yeah, that, the, the grading method is very simple in that sense. But in in general, um, you cannot simultaneously find the best algorithm, find the algorithm's performance and also design the algorithm with the best performance. You either have to fix the optimization certificate and then optimize over the algorithm, or you have to fix the algorithm and optimize over the certificate. Um, this is actually similar to why robust control synthesis is difficult. If I give you a, a control problem and I say, you know, is this robustly stable, then that's one problem that you can solve. But if I say design the controller that maximizes some objective for which it is robustly stable, then that becomes a much more difficult problem. And the same thing, same phenomenon is occurring here. Um, it's each individual problem is, is a convex problem, but they're not jointly convex. So you cannot do both at the same time. Okay, let's thank Laurent again. Thank you.